Good morning, church. For all those that didn't say good morning, I'm not offended, but good morning. Today's a uh, communion Sunday, amen. Today we have a baptism, amen. And uh, today's the Lord's Day to where we get to sing to Him. And I really hope that you come ready to sing to Him. Uh, the young folk, the young men and young women up to your front left are already standing. Good example, right? So let's stand up. Come on. I didn't mean to point you a lot. But. Uh, Lord, this is your day. It's not our day. And uh, Father, everything that we do, all of our hearts and our affections are on you. The sermon might be great and the music might be great, but Jesus, this is about you. So thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that all week long you walked by us and you showed us the way. Thank you that we got to be here. Thank you for health and strength. Thank you for a mind that can think about you and for those that are in our lives that need you. I pray that you would even now be in their life, that your presence would be among us. We need your help today and I call upon you to to be here with us. Spirit, send your presence among us and we love you. For the young people in the room, Help them to know that we love you more than we love music and more than we love church. We love you, Jesus. And I pray that today you would be honored by the what we do, what we say, what we sing. In Jesus' name. Can you sing this with me? Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with me. Sing now. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Can I get one clap? Clap your hands, all you peoples. Oh, say it with me. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with loud shouts of joy. Shout to God with loud shouts of joy. For the Lord, for the Lord most high is to be feared. The great king over all the earth. It says this in the next verse. God has gone up with a shout. 
the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. Look at somebody and say, Amen, sing.
seat for just a second. Uh, we have a baptism today. Anybody fired up about this? Uh, if you've never seen this before, uh, this is part of what we as a church family do on the regular. When people put their trust in Jesus, they symbolize it by going down into the water, just like Jesus went down into the grave, carrying our sins so far away, coming up out of the water. We don't leave them down, I promise. They come up out of the water, and Jesus could not be held in the grave either. And we get to celebrate this. We get to remind ourselves. And today, Abigail Hazard is going to be baptized by her dad, Brian. And this, yeah, you can fire up, but you can fire up about that. And I was, talk, I was talking upstairs with her uh, just, just before service started. Um, and I said, hey, do you remember the very first people, uh, the very first person to tell others that Jesus had been raised from the dead? She's like, uh, yeah, Mary Magdalene, that's right. An unlikely Maybe a little girl, you know, maybe an unlikely, unlikely source that Jesus commissioned to tell the world of what God had done um, in Jesus. And today we get to see another unlikely little girl tell us, remind us of what is so formative, the story that we tell over and over and over again. And this is Abigail's testimony. Hi, my name is Abigail. And um, this spring I went and I curled up with my mom. And I said a prayer, and I accepted Jesus into my life. And now I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. And um, three days later, he rose again. And now I'm going to go tell everybody that he's the Savior of the world. Amen. Amen. Church family, uh, this is likely one of the proudest days for a mom and a dad uh, to be able to uh, have their daughter um, accept Christ and show that to to you uh, and to the world. Um, Abigail, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again for your sins? Is it your intention to follow Him always? Yes. All right. With that profession of faith, we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Christ in baptism and raised to life. Amen. God, I come to you and thank you uh, for Abigail. I uh, thank you for her willingness um, and her decision to follow you. I pray that as this uh, first testimony of hers, this first sermon, um, will get heard and will get resounded, um, and that you will be more glorified uh, in this and through, that you will get the glory through Abigail's decision. I pray that you will give us a, a guide her, um, guide her life, guide her as as she goes through and help us as parents and church family uh, to process process her through that. And we're praying. Amen. Come on. Praise the Lord. Uh, amen. Glad about that. In the back of the seats, there's some cards uh, that you can fill out and drop in the offering plate or in the offering box as you leave. Uh, it's also got a QR code. Some of you are wiping tears. So why are you wiping tears? Can we stand up and say hello to a handful of people around you and just say they're glad that they showed up and didn't stay in bed?
given under heaven by which you, me, anybody, little girls, little boys, old girls, old boys, no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. That's how powerful the name of Jesus is. But not like an incantation. It's not a magic spell. We speak that and it just happens. It's a surrender of our lives to him and all that he um, is, all that he said, all that he did. We put our trust in him. First Sunday of the month, we come to pray for salvation for people. People in our lives who are either far from God or don't know him at all. People who have not confessed the name of Jesus. And so this morning, if you came and you want to pray for somebody in your life, in your sphere, your circle, maybe in your family, in your, on your ball team, whatever it may be, uh, we're going to invite you forward. We move our bodies physically to represent what we ask God to do spiritually. So come. There's places to kneel. You can make this an altar. You want to pray for somebody who doesn't know the Lord uh, or is far from him. You make your way right now. We'll pray in just a moment. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful Lots of lives up here represented, Father. Uh, there's brokenness, there's darkness, there's frustration, there's um, strongholds, there are thought patterns, there are addictions, there are prodigals, and there are loss. And so we pray that the name of Jesus would pierce through all of that. Go right through it. And as we prayed in the first service, so we pray now that you, even today, would just make some space for the beautiful, wonderful, powerful name of Jesus to take up residence inside of people. And all that you are, and all that you said, all that you promised, all that you accomplished, that would become a reality for people who don't know you yet and for people who maybe have known you but walked away because they felt like they got a better deal in some far off country. Jesus, we're asking that you would bring them home. We're asking that you would bring salvation. We've said it before and so now we say it again. Um, that's your part. Our part certainly is to bear witness to the goodness, to the beauty, um, to the wonder, and to the power of Jesus. But uh, for our part, we sign up. We're, we're, our hands are raised to say yes and amen to that. Count us in on that task. We want to be a part of that. But Jesus, we can't save people. We can't transform a life. We can't bring sight to the blind. We can't bring a life where there's death. We cannot put our light in darkness. Only you can do that. So on behalf of every person represented here, there is a name that is salvation. It's your name, Jesus. And there's no other path. There's no other option. There's not a back door. So we're praying, Jesus, that you would get a hold of these people represented here. Change their hearts. Change their lives change their eternities as a result. All of this we give to you now. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray that powerful name. Everybody said amen and amen. Thank you. You can return to your seats or have a seat if you're up here. Thank you. The grace of God that we just sang about is ours because of who Jesus is and what he's done one of the expressions of that is gratitude um, in light of the grace that comes into our lives. And so uh, we come to this point where we'll give. If you um, are ready, came ready to give in person, you can drop it in the plate when it goes by here. If you filled out one of those cards with either a prayer request or just a registration, hey, I was here and uh, I want some more information about who you are as a church, please drop that in the plate. If the plate gets by you on any of those counts, no big deal. There's a box uh, in the back and you can drop it there afterwards. Thanks for participating in worship with us.
saying is, boy, that's how we want it right there. Just like that. And so that's what we want. The name of Jesus to be um, honored and um, uh, him to be lifted up here in our midst, in our own lives. And so if, if you have a Bible today, we're going to be in the book of John and invite you to John chapter 15. Normally at this point we dismiss kids, but for Sunday of the month we uh, keep them in here to uh, celebrate with us and remind ourselves of good and important things, particularly as communion uh, is going to unfold here in a little bit. Um, we try to balance that where they get a little training in here. And also uh, when we send them to jam on the other weeks, uh, they get some uh, truth there in an environment that connects with them. John chapter 15 is where we're going to be. If you're a user of the Bible app, you can open up the app and find our live event, track along with that and uh, uh, find sermon notes and that kind of thing. If you need a Bible that you can put in your lap, there's some on the side of the tech booth back there. Feel free to grab one and take it with you if you need to, one that you could just read and keep. That'd be great. <clears throat> Here in the book of John, Jesus has been outlaying for us, kind of uh, uh, picturing for us, depicting for us, painting this for us, uh, the kind of life that a spirit-filled follower of Jesus uh, lives. And so in chapter 13, uh, they are a servant who also loves. So they wash feet and they give themselves in love. In chapter 14, they trust despite the troubles of this world. Um, and then they obey. That was chapter 14, trust and obey. Chapter 15, we pick up abiding, abiding. I forgot to say this earlier, just a big welcome to those of you who are online. Glad that you're here. Um, and so it, because kids are in here, I got a couple of moments here in the sermon that I'm going to need some kid help. Now in the 830 service, kid help came in some very strange forms, like like some very deep voices uh, express themselves. I mean, I don't want any of you to talk to me right now. I need kid help. Everybody say kid help. That's what I need. Okay, so kids in the room, here's what I need. Can we name some different kinds of fruit trees? Can we name some different fruit trees? Let's go. You don't even have to raise your hand. Just say it out loud, G. Apple, peach, orange, lemon. And all of that. Tomato tree? A tomato tree. Ah, I mean. Here's, okay, so here's the follow-up. Here's the follow-up. You ready? Really important question. If I, if I saw a tree, but I didn't see the kind of fruit that was hanging off of it, would I necessarily know what kind of tree that it was? No. But if I saw a tree and there were apple trees on it, I mean apples on it, what would I know? It's an apple tree. Why? Because you know the kind of tree by, by the fruit that's on it. That's exactly right. Even tomato trees. You know that it's a tomato tree if you see tomatoes happening. This is part of why I love kids being in the room, man. There's always awesome chaos right there. It's just part of it. It's so fun. You know the tree by the fruit that you see. And so I just want to bring that up to say that there are uh, uh, pieces of the text today where Jesus will talk about fruit. 
And he's doing so in that exact way. He wants us to be able to identify spiritual life by the fruit that comes off. So John chapter 15, um, I'm going to read the first uh, 11 verses. We'll walk that down and then we'll just break it up into a couple of chunks here. Here we go. I am the true vine. Just pause right there. The reason he says true vine is because the vine imagery is carried over from the Old Testament where Israel is called the vine. But now he's saying, hey, look, you thought because of your ethnic heritage that you, no, no, no. All of that stuff, all of that stuff was pointing to me. So Jesus is saying, this, I am the fulfillment of all that was in the Old Testament. I am the true vine and my father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Uh, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. Branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and they're burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear, <clears throat> excuse me, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So we're talking about abiding today, and this picture of the vine. And here's where we want to start. Um, just kind of break it up into three chunks here. The, the first big piece goes something like this, is that we are in good hands. Verse 1, look, look back at it. I am the true vine, and who's the vine dresser? My father's the vine dresser. Uh, how many of you have ever had this moment where uh, you've been outside trying to prune something or pull something, uh, jerking up weeds out of your flower bed or whatever, and you, you go to jerk on something and you realize that was a tremendous mistake because now you're pulling up like half the flowers that are because the way that you jerk that thing up, it's just done. The father does not make that kind of mistake. He knows what he's doing. Uh, how many of you have gone at something, you go to prune something, cut something, uh, it either slips or, or you catch a little bit too much and now you've injured the actual good branch while you were trying to get the bad branch done? It's, uh, how many of you, this is just a switch metaphors here from the vine to construction stuff because I did this, I mean, not too long ago and I had to laugh at myself. You go, you measure, you cut the board, you go back and you measure and it's still too short, right? Like you cut it as many times as you want to and dead gum it, it's still too short. Good. The father makes no mistakes like that. He has, our father, the vine dresser, is our father. And the father has great skill and good intentions for you and for me. He, he is not haphazard. He is not some uh, rush uh, lawn crew that shows up, takes their $35, and, and you're like, dude, I mean, like, look at that right there. Like, couldn't could we have done that? He is not that. He is intimately involved, and he is pruning, working, cleaning, uh, uh, trimming. He is doing it, um, and he is careful. He has great skill, and he has good intentions about this. He can, uh, because unlike you and me, he can. And he will accomplish exactly what he intends. Now, you may ask the question. It's a worthwhile question. Because I'm, some of you have kind of pushed past the imagery already and said, I don't know if I like this pruning thing. That doesn't sound like much fun. In fact, it might hurt. Does it hurt sometimes? Yes, absolutely. Here's the, here's the promise of the scripture, though. Um, that God will absolutely not take anything more than necessary. And furthermore, if I've got something that's kind of wrapped around me, so to speak, and, and it may be choking at least portions of my life, wouldn't it be better to live without that? What's the answer to that? Yes. Even if it hurt a little bit? Yes. Or if I've got something that is, can't quite bud, can't quite come to life, can't quite um, a really uh, flourish in the way, w w because something's in the way, wouldn't it be good to clean that out of the way so that I can really have this? Wouldn't that be worth it? The answer is yes. The pain of letting something go that's hurting us or the pain of moving something out of the way so that something can grow, wouldn't that be worth it? The answer is yes. Does it hurt sometimes? Absolutely. But God has great skill and he has good intentions and you can trust him. 
we are in good hands. What is he after here? The Greek word that's underneath all of this is a word that you may recognize. The, the word is catharsis. Anybody know something about this word, either cathartic or catharsis? It's a sense of cleansing. It's a, it's a um, not like stripping it bare. That's not what we're talking about there. But really, like cleaning out the stuff that doesn't need to be there. If you've uh, uh, been to an older house where the, the trees or the uh, uh, the bushes kind of you know, like really grew down and then there's not... You know they're not doing it anymore, and what, as a result, the grass underneath is 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 dying. But you go in and you you have a cathartic moment with the tree where you uh, clean out some of the stuff, and the sun can get. This is what we're talking about here. He's cleaning us. Look back at verse three. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. How is he cleaning us? How is he? Because that that cleaning and pruning word. There's the same word, exact same word. How, how is he doing so? He's doing so by his word. The, the word of Jesus to us. Already you're clean because of the word Jesus says that I have spoken to you. And he's doing so in the power of the spirit. As the spirit points us back to what Jesus has said. This is what we talked about last week. As the spirit points us back, reminds us of the things Jesus has said. This is how he's cleaning us. And, and so I, I want to say this as we remind ourselves about communion here in just a few minutes. As we remind ourselves of these truths, as Abigail um, built, bore testimony with her baptism. Listen, because of Jesus... You are already clean because of the word that he has spoken to you. If you came this morning ready to clean yourself up so that you could come to church and hear his word or sing his praise, you're already clean because of the word that he has spoken. If you have put your trust in Jesus, he has done the work in you to make you clean before him. This is what we will remind ourselves of. You are not too broken. You are not too far gone. You are not beyond repair. You are not useless. You are not religiously or ritually um, unclean or separated or distant. You do not carry a history that is too heavy or too dark. He's after this. And we can trust him. He's the vine dresser. And he knows what he's doing. There is a single goal that comes along with this. And I bet you could probably guess what this goal is. Verse 4. Excuse me. Verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from you, apart from me, you can do nothing. What's kind of the key word of the passage? Abide. This is the one goal that we have, is to abide. What is he talking about here? Um, it's just a reminder of a couple of things. And these are, we'll tease out some of the implications in just a second. But I just want to remind us of a couple of things. That Jesus, because he is the vine and we're the branches, he is the source of our life. He's the source. We're not, uh, we didn't wake up this morning and decide that we were going to be alive. Jesus is the source of that life. That's true physically. That's also true spiritually. Jesus has given us his life, and if you will, his power flows from the vine to us, the branches. He is the source of our life. And secondly, he is the means to that kind of life. If we are disconnected from him, then the spiritual life that he wants us to have, it will not flow. It doesn't just jump the gap. There's no arcing. It's not electricity. This is botany. Staying connected to him is how we live. And then don't miss this in chapter, in the, not chapter 5, verse 5. There is a promise. As, as we abide in him, there is a promise. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that might bear much fruit. No? Possibly bear fruit? No, no. Will bear fruit. There's the promise right there. The, the, the essence, if you will, of the fruitful life is the essence of abiding. If we abide, um, we bear fruit. There is the promise of fruit. There. So he is the source of our life. He is the means to that life as he imparts that life to us. And as a result of that, we will see fruit. Now, the promise of fruit, apples, oranges, all that kind of stuff. When it shows up, we will be able to say, this is the life of Jesus. We'll talk more about that here in just a second. Let, let me ask a question, a little pastoral application here before we uh, move on. What keeps us from this kind of thing, though? Like, what, what would hinder us? From abiding in him. One of the things we've certainly experienced culturally over the past four or five years is fear. The Spirit said, excuse me, the scripture says in 1 Timothy 1 verse 7, but God has not given us a spirit of fear. But instead of power and love and of a sound mind, he gives us a power to live. He, he gives us a sense of what we should be doing. He gives us Love, um, a spirit of love, such that we reach out to others and genuinely want their best. And he gives us a sound mind so that we think clearly. 
I don't know if you know this, but we've been advertised and propagandized to, to death. And so the messaging, if you will, that's in the culture out here can get pretty loud. And the static on the line can be pretty distracting. And so Jesus gives us a sound mind. The Spirit gives us a sound mind so that we can think clearly. Fear can keep us from this. Another one that keeps us from this is condemnation. This is when the enemy kind of climbs up on our shoulder right here, starts chirping in our ear. Hey, you remember that thing two weeks ago? I remember it. I'm sure you remember it. You remember it? Oh, yeah, you remember it. Have you talked to God about that yet? I'm sure you shouldn't, because if you do, I promise you, he's going to say something. I don't want to talk to you about this, because, uh, you know, you promised me last time you wouldn't do this anymore. And let's, yeah, So if God's not going to talk to you about it, then what are you going to do? You're going to have to figure this out on your own, man. You're going to have to isolate yourself, like go away, like do something, like pull back, do something else other than what you're doing right now. This is how he gets in our ear and starts chirping. But the scripture says what? Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It sounds a lot like you are already clean. That's what it sounds like. There's no condemnation, but it, it would keep us from abiding to it. Just our, uh, the, the uh, sense of we're not worthy uh, before him. Thirdly, um, I just brought this up because uh, it's an election year. The promises of false messiahs, we have a deliverer. We have one that we follow. Okay? It matters. It matters. All the political process, that stuff matters for our in daily life. That's true. We have one we follow. We are citizens of a kingdom, and I am so glad uh, to, to remind us of that today. And lastly, it, instead of keeping, uh, instead of uh, abiding, we can, we can be kept from uh, abiding, uh, excuse me, by, by a sense of discord or disunity. If there's something within us, something within us, uh, or something within uh, our church family that, that is separating us from one another, uh, that can be a real uh, uh, turnoff uh, to folks who are like, I, I don't want to abide. If this is what abiding looks like, I don't want any part of that. Well, that's not what abiding looks like, but still, the discord and the disunity pushes us apart. The references there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 uh, in the Corinthian church, Paul looks at the, fo the folks and he goes, Hey, look, some of you are saying, I'm of Paul, uh, I'm of Peter. Uh, no, no, I'm Team Apollos. And some of you are so religious, you're like, I hate all you people. I'm following Jesus. You know, that's kind of pull out the Jesus card there. Paul puts a little smack down on them. Hey, look, we, we're all, we, we, we got one Savior, one Lord. And listen, all of this division stuff, it's not going to work. Compare that to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, where it says, be diligent or work hard. To preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Church family, we have far more, in, we have far more in common than anything that would separate us. And a hundred years from now, we'll be, be celebrating that. We will be celebrating that. These are the kinds of things that can keep us away. So uh, before, we, uh, before we press ahead, I just want to go back to verse 6 and ask this question. Here's, here's verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. Branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. A few weeks ago, uh, one of you came up and actually asked me uh, about this verse. Hey, what does this mean? Does this mean that people who genuinely put their trust in Jesus can then be like cut off and thrown away? Um, what, what, what does that mean? What does that look like? How would that be? And the answer is no, that's not what it means because Jesus is the one who saved us. Jesus is the one who keeps us. Amen to that? I came to preach this morning. Are you with me? I know it's kind of gray outside. Listen, Jesus is the one who saved us, and Jesus is the one who keeps us. Amen and amen. If it depends on me to hold my life, if, if it depends on me as a branch to keep myself in the vine, I'm in trouble. Some of you are better than me. Some of you are a lot more trouble than me. I don't know, but like we're all in trouble, I think is the deal. Jesus is the one who not only has saved us, he is also the one who keeps us. So what does verse 6 mean? Um, it would go something like this. And again, kids, this is where I need your help. Okay? So here's, here's a picture. Can you identify the healthy trees and the, or the healthy vines and the not very healthy vines? Which ones are healthy, y'all? The green ones. The green ones. That's exactly right. Which ones or what color is the one that you would think, ooh, I don't know about that one. Oh, yeah. It's kind of red. And you see the one kind of maybe third one down there, kind of brownish? That doesn't look good at all, does it? You want to go grab some grapes off that guy? Ugh, no way, man. Now, pause right there. Is that pretty easy to see? Yeah, you can see that. You're like, hey, there's some live stuff, and then there's some stuff. Sometimes it really is that easy. Sometimes it really is. 
Sometimes, though, it's a little bit more complicated. It looks something like this. Uh oh. Oh. Now, which one's alive? And which one's dead? Uh huh. A couple of you. I, I see you, Clay, looking, trying, trying to discern which one it is. It's really hard to see right there. It's hard to tell what is what, isn't it? Sometimes this is exactly what it can be. People are around the things of God. People are around the vine. People are con connected in the sense of intertwined with, wrapped in, out. Uh, and you, you look at it and you're like, gosh, all of this looks like it's good. Except for, I mean, there's some spots there that it doesn't look particularly good. And it, I, I certainly don't see any fruit coming off. And then you start tracing that little vine right there. You, this is what the Lord will do. He, he just makes sure that the, the real true vines, they're the ones that bear fruit. And even if we're intertwined, even if we're, uh, uh, you know, kind of in the vicinity of, even if we are in the building and, and there's no fruit coming off of us, then you ask the question, well, good gosh, what, what would that, what would it, what, what might that mean? What might that mean? Jesus tells a similar parable um, when he says this, uh, th there's a, 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 a field and they planted wheat, but somebody came along and there was tares, there were uh, weeds that, that grew up with the wheat. And Jesus goes, hey man, we'll sort this out at the end of time. Don't you worry about it. We got this. So here, I just, I just point out, like that, that's the kind of stuff that, that John chapter 15 verse 6 and other places mean like this. Is that um, we don't want to be just around the things of God. We want to be in the things of God. We want to be participating in the things of God. Okay, so how, what does this look like? What might we do? Verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, how do we, we have this single goal, how do we go about actually doing the abiding? Like, what does it look like? Um, number one, we abide in God's word. Did you see that? Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, how do your, how does the word of the Lord abide in us? Um, we pick the scriptures up and we read it. We intake it. Um, we spend time in it personally. We sit in moments like this of where it is taught. We go to Sunday school or small group. We find another Bible study. We are connected not only to other believers, but connected to other believers because of and through um, the word that sits in front of us there. We have moments where we can dialogue about it. We talk about it at home uh, with our family. Uh, we talk about it when we're... Um, you know, in other places, uh, we can maybe listen to it as we drive, whatever it may be. We spend time and we make the effort, we take the time to invest and let the Word of God get into us. This is how we abide. One of the ways that we abide is in His Word. And so let me just pastorally ask you a couple of questions. What's your intake level right now? When it comes to the Scriptures, what's your intake level? Are you getting enough spiritual nutrients to sustain the life that God wants to develop in you and live through you? One uh, meal a week won't get it done. A meal and a couple of snacks between here and there, it's going to leave you pretty hungry. Are you getting the spiritual calories, so to speak, the spiritual nutrients that it takes to really develop into what God who God desires you to be. Abiding in God's word. What's your intake level? Secondly, what's your intake pace? This has become more and more important for me um, personally. And so I just wanted to say it out loud. Your intake pace being what? What does that mean? Do you just read and be like, oh yeah, okay, I got this. Or do you press play and you listen and you're like, oh, okay, cool. I got this. We need to slow down. Nothing in our culture is going to slow. We need to intentionally slow down. And when something smacks us, we're reading along. Or like, we need to read at a pace where something can smack us. But then when we're reading along and something smacks us, we just need to hit the brakes and just pause right there. Press pause to say, okay, God, what are you saying to me through that phrase? And then ultimately, that, that intake gets uh, expressed. Um, it has to meet, if you will, um, it, its, its fulfillment. Um, it, by putting it into action. This is verse 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I kept my father's commandments. We, we have to put this to, we got to put feet to this. We have to do what he says. And, and better than just do what he says, we intake it and then practice these things so that we become the kind of people who regularly do what he says. This is what he's after. 
This is the way that we abide. We abide in God's word and we abide uh, in obedience. And just one pastoral question. Is there a spot in your life, any particular sphere right now, that you would say, yeah, God's been talking about that to me and I'm a, um, well, I'm going to get to it. Uh, no, no. You need to get to it. So, what are the outcomes of this? And this is, I will finish off the passage here, starting in verse 8, and I'm actually going to work backwards for just a second. Starting in verse 8, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide. Uh, sorry, verse, that was verse 9. Verse 8, by this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Glory. There is glory given to God. God is seen for who he is and enjoyed for who he is. In our lives, because of the ways that Jesus is bearing fruit through us, because of the ways that we are intaking the word, and because of the ways we are obeying the word, God is getting glory from us. And other people see it, and they're like, man, that looks like a God to follow. That looks like a, a worthwhile um, uh, uh, investment for me is to step into that right there. We give God glory. Secondly, in verse 7, there's answered prayer. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Hey, this is one of those verses. It is not a magic verse, okay? Again, one more time, this is not formulaic. This is we let the scriptures shape who we are so much that our lives align with the agenda of God. And when we pray, we see those things happen because this is what God desires to do in us and through us and for us and with us. It's not, oh, okay, I'm going to go read my Bible, and now God has to answer my prayer. You don't get to hold God hostage like that. That's not how we roll Certainly not how he rules. But when we are shaped by the scriptures, when we are shaped by that abiding presence of Jesus in our lives and, and uh, the, the life-giving um, energy that he gives to us, this, this is, we, uh, we experience answers to prayer. Um, and then look back at verse 5 again. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We've, there's fruit that is born. What, what would that look like? I'm so glad you asked. I just I pulled together a short list out of the New Testament. There are more, but here are some. And if you're one of those uh, uh, take a picture people, because I can't write that fast, perfectly fine. Uh, I'll just hit a couple of them. Uh, there is the fruit of character, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those kind of things, there's no law against those. That's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5. There's a built-in infrastructure of soul, character, that that's, is sustaining us and, and does sustain us. Uh, even when things go crazy, character. Uh, there's good works, the fruit of good works. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, there's the fruit of, in Philippians chapter 4, of generosity. Paul says specifically, I don't want the gift. I want the fruit that increases to your benefit, to your credit. So one of the ways, and when the Spirit goes to work in us, and the life-giving uh, power of Jesus is at work in us, we are abiding in him. One of the ways that expresses itself in generosity. Was that about money? Sure. It's way worse than that, though. I mean, it's time and effort and kind of approaching life with an open arms to say, hey, yeah, I want to embrace the people who are around me and be generous towards them. Um, righteousness, Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 11. It's at the end of the part. There's a section there in chapter 12 in Hebrews where it talks about God disciplines us for our good that we can share his holiness. And then he says, and this is the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Uh, there's praise that comes off of our lips. Uh, Hebrews 13, verse 15. Um, let us then offer up this sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of lips that gives thanks to his name. There's freedom, Romans 6, 22. There's ministry that happens, Colossians 1, uh, verse 6 there. And then finally, joy. This is in our passage, verse 11. I, uh, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you. Excuse me, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. He desires this. For us, and he wants to take the, the, I mean, just think about that. The very joy of Jesus, when we are abiding in him, takes up resonance in our lives and begins to express itself. How do we know this is going to be real? How do we know this is going to be true? How do we know this is going to happen? Well, because God's commitment to this process, to this pruning, fruit bearing process, it, it's the same level of commitment, the same steadfastness. It's his love. Look back at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Don't miss that. that that's one of those verses you could slide past in this, in this passage. How has the Father loved Jesus? Eternally? Yeah. Passionately? Yes. Um, uh, uh, with a sense of 
man, let, let's, let's do something in him and through him in order to bring glory to you. Yes, all of those things. Steadfastly, yes. Faithfully, yes. Tenderly, yes. As the Father has loved the Son, so Jesus himself loves you. His commitment to this process is as steadfast as his love. What does that mean? It means that there's no branch so weak that it, is, that it cannot receive the love that he has. There, there is no uh, uh, little, just small little thing that you're holding on to that can't hold the joy that Jesus wants to put in you. He's told us these things, that his joy can be in us and our joy could be full. What's the guarantee of that? Well, this is why we come to communion. Just to stay with the metaphor. Jesus was cut off, broken off, separated, so that you and I could be grafted in. You, Jesus was the one who was pulled away, so to speak, so that you and I could be brought into right relationship with God. This happened at the cross where he died for our sins and rose again. Where, where G, when Jesus, when he died, um, the, the gospels consistently report, he said, oh my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was separated in that moment so that we could be brought near. He was the branch that was broken off so that you and I could really have life. This is what we remind ourselves when we come to communion. Let's pray together and then we'll celebrate Lord's Supper. Why don't you take just a second and ask the Holy Spirit if there's anything that had your name on it in particular. Now, Father, um, as we look to the tables to remind ourselves of the good news of what Jesus has done, to tell ourselves the story over and over and over again, it would be fresh for us and glorifying to you. I pray that um, every single person here would know of the passionate and steadfast love that you have for them, that was demonstrated in Jesus. I pray for them. That would be a reality for all of us. Grant us that now. Be honored by what we do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you've never been part of um, communion here as in our church family, we've got five stations around. You're free to move to those stations here at any point uh, in the next several minutes. Uh, we're not in a hurry. Um, it's when you get there, just take the elements there and you just slide out of the way so folks behind you can do that. Please make sure that if you've got somebody next to you who looks like they may need some help, uh, feel free to um, just help them in that way. That would be great. Let's stand together and we'll celebrate communion.
Sunday, May 19th, we're having church conference. That'll be here at 5 p.m. Looking uh, looking backwards towards all the things that God has done, which this is what we do at church conference, by the way. We don't just, like, we, we have a good time. We, it's worshipful. We look at things God has done, but then also looking forward to the things that we are excited to see the Lord do this summer. So, I'd love to see you at church conference. Also, on May 19th, stick with that Sunday, is Deacon Nomination. Really excited for this, really excited to add brothers to our deacon body. But if you have seen brothers that you have seen serving, uh, you can nominate them for uh, to be a deacon, to be ordained as a deacon here at our church. So excited to nominate and bring new brothers into the deacon body. If you can't be here on Sunday the 19th, there are some forms back there that you can find and do that ahead of time. But looking forward to Sunday the 19th. It's going to be a good one. Uh, we've got some summer things coming up. Who's excited for those? I am very excited. These are VBS things and Pine Cove City things. And uh, student ministry has mission trips and camp coming up. So if you have, um, uh, if you're not signed up for those things, you should do that like today. If you have questions about that, don't leave. You can find me for student things. Find Nina for kids things. She's back there. We would love, love, love to get your name on the list for these summer things coming up. Don't be afraid to ask. Mother's Day is coming up. Who's excited? Everybody good? Yeah. All right. So what we love to do is receive pictures from you. And we'll make a slideshow, put it up in the building for everybody to see, make it really special. Uh, but we need your action on this. Okay? And it's coming up. So don't wait. Don't wait. You can send those pictures to media.team at heritagepark.org. All right? You see it up there? Media team at heritagepark.org. Send us those pictures. We'd love to get them. Make something special. Amen and amen. Uh, listen, if you're a guest with us, I'd love to meet you. I'll be right down here by the coffee pot if you want to pray about something or start a conversation. That's where I'll be. Uh, just come by. Uh, say, hey, um, there's a world out there that needs believers who are tied. Who are tied to the vine. Not just around it, but tied to it. Because the fruit, the life that flows through us as a result. Man, that, that's, that's a game changer for folks. So we get to go from here. Like what we said and what we said was true. Your commission to go live like Jesus reigns over everything. God bless you. Thanks so much for coming. Have a great, great, great afternoon. Happy Sunday.